Worship, y'all about blew the roof off of here. Like I could have just stayed there all all day long, um, but we stopped, and so now we're going to do some other stuff. Um, this is going to be fun today. It's, it's it's a little convicting, though. I will say, the scripture can be a lot convicting as we start to get into it. But I do kind of want to circle back for just a moment, and Jay talked about it just now. But if you remember um, last week. If you are here or listen to the message, we did talk about baptism that Peter said for us to be baptized and to remember our baptism. And so if that's been on your heart, sometimes knowing that someone is going to be baptized encourages us to step out and step into it. And so we would love to have you join us in that um, next week. So if you don't know me, I'm Jane. I'm one of the pastors here and Either you have the fortunate or unfortunate event of listening to me two weeks in a row. You can start to feel how my kids feel of listening to me every single day and maybe pray for them more. I don't know. Um, Last week, I want to share our takeaways so that we can kind of then dive into 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, If you need a Bible, we want to give you one. And Pastor Jay is back there. If you just raise your hand, this is for yours to keep. You can write in it. You can take it home and pray over it and use it in your everyday. Just raise your hand and he will bring one to you. And you can start headed towards the back to 1 Peter chapter 4. So last week, our takeaways were these. I want to keep this in mind as we get into chapter 4. One, we need to seek Jesus and to be like him in our speech, in our actions, our social media, our interactions, and our responses. Jesus tells us to be different from the world, and he's really leaning into that today in today's scripture of how to be different from the world. Two, we are not to pay back evil with evil or insult with insult. Remember that from the word. That could be one of the most difficult things for us because sometimes we almost have a a visceral response to say something, and Jesus is kind of saying, simmer down. Like, don't say that. Don't respond. When you think that Jesus does not know how bad your situation is, remember that he went all the way to the cross for you and for me. Third, be ready to give your answer for where you find your hope in Jesus. And I hope you spent time on that. I gave you that as a homework assignment. It would be fun to have someone stand up and share, but I won't make you do that. But to think about how you share the hope that you have in Jesus. What words do you use? What words would you use if you answered God's promptings to share about your relationship with Jesus? Four, keep a clear conscience. When we keep a clear conscience, nothing can be held against us. And we can only do that by seeking God. And five, consider and remember what your baptism did mean and means to you today. And if you feel prompted to be baptized, do it. Tell the world that you believe in Jesus. Remember the scripture said, um, kind of like how I often share about baptism, that is, it's not like soap getting off the dirt that we use a shower or bath for. It's cleaning our inside. And it's our public um, pronouncement of our faith in Jesus and knowing how good that he is in our life. And so today, as we get into the word, I want to ask you this. I know I always use my kids, but it's because I live with them. (laughs) So I'm not saying anything really particular today, but either with your kids or your spouse or maybe people you work with, no pointing fingers today, and you don't have to confess to me today, maybe to God. Have you ever thought or said, man, you need an attitude adjustment? Anybody? I mean, sometimes. Sometimes I will say to my kids, like, how about not yell at me? Like, I'm your cheerleader and your funder, so... I don't know if that's a word. It is now. But um, I fund you, so don't yell at me. 
Also, I give you food. And like, simmer down. Sometimes, as we're going to hear in Scripture today, it might be God saying to us, you need an attitude adjustment, right? I shared in the first service, and, and maybe you had similar parents, that we, I grew up in Tampa Bay area of Florida, which in case you don't know it, I love Florida. But um, we would go to vacation in North Carolina or Tennessee, which is a really long way from the Tampa Bay area full of I-75, which is full of nothing, and we did not have the pleasure of electronics or movies or games. And sometimes we might not have behaved the best, or maybe my parents overreacted, I don't know. But my dad would say this, if you don't stop, guess what he was going to do? Pull over on the side of the road. I definitely did not want that to happen. I don't think I ever actually caused him to do that. Maybe he got really mad a few times, I'm not sure. I've never, I don't think I've said that to my children because one, one piece of parenting advice I actually listened to was don't promise punishment to your kids that you're not willing to follow through on. I'm like, I'm not pulling over on I-75. We might deal with it when we get there, but I'm not pulling over. But what he was telling me and my brother was, you definitely need an attitude adjustment. If you don't fix it, I'm going to give you an attitude adjustment, the old-fashioned way. I was really scared of being in trouble, so I simmered down really, really quickly when that happened. Um, some might have called me a goody-goody. Uh, I'm not sure. Basically, I don't like to. I still don't like to get in trouble. So today, just like last week when we were talking about all this stuff in our world that challenges us as Christ followers, that Peter's talking to us. And, and we're going to talk about the scripture later um, that Justin had read for us, and we're talking about when Jesus is going to return. And people are like, when is Jesus going to return? Jesus is going to return. We got to be ready. Or these are signs that Jesus is going to return. And sometimes we become so focused on that that we become less focused on actually following Jesus. And as a pastor, I've run into that all my whole, every year of ministry, because stuff happens. Wars happen, um, there are attacks, there are hurricanes, there are fires, there are things that people do that harm each other, there are terrible world events, and then people will come into church and they'll be like, oh, this must be one of the signs that Jesus is coming back. Now, I submit to you that ever since Jesus died and rose again, he told his disciples that he was coming back soon. Remember that? We're now in 2024, and Jesus has not come back. And every single generation has faced terrible things. And I'm not saying that none of them are signs that Jesus is coming back, but what our focus ought to be on is actually Jesus and living for Jesus and living in his ways and teaching people about Jesus and not as focused on when he's coming back. As long as we're following Jesus, it doesn't really matter. But our goal should be to share Jesus with as many people as possible. And living for Jesus versus the world and how the world is living, which we're constantly challenged. It doesn't matter if you're in elementary school or high school or college or grown up. There are challenges every day to us as living as a Christ follower would live. The danger is if we give in to that, say we hang out with our friends, and we should have friends of everybody because how else are we going to spread the gospel? But it's what we do when we hang out with our friends that don't yet know Jesus. If we do everything that they do, that we know in our hearts is not what Jesus would do, then we're not a good witness to them of Jesus. How do we do that? And we have to be conscious and intentional because as the scripture today says, we gave up stuff when we came to know Jesus. We can't keep going back to that well. 
And as Christ followers, we have to keep extending forgiveness and seeking holiness, simply meaning I want to be more like Jesus today than yesterday and serving and and giving a witness. We talked about that last week and speaking the word of God in our lives. First Peter really calls us out. Remember last week, those words Peter used, all y'all, remember that? He said, you, all of you, all of you that follow Jesus. He's talking to every one of us that follow Jesus. There's not one person that is left out. He's saying, I am speaking to you because you are Jesus' witness in this world. So if we go to 1 Peter chapter 4, it starts with this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. We haven't come that far in 2,000 years, huh? They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you, but they will have you have, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is a reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. He's talking to us and he's going deeper, addressing how we should live because he knows that if we do this, if we live as Jesus wants us to do, it's going to change us, it's going to change others, and ultimately it's going to change the world. We can't blame others on the world. We know the world is filled with evil. We talked about that last week, that the enemy is here, part of this world. We have a job to change the world by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus in our lives, and by reflecting him in our lives. And we're going to draw from scriptures that he calls us to stretch. He challenges us, which is a challenge because we like to live in a comfortable box, don't we? How many people go to a restaurant and order the same thing every single time? (laughs) Man, you guys are on the honest train. You guys are getting used to me now. They're like, she's going to ask a question sometime today. Right? You look at the whole menu like you're going to change your mind. (laughs) Don't you? And then you're like, I'll have the chicken nuggets. And I will have two sides of fries. Right? That's comfort. We like what we like. We go to people that we feel comfortable with to talk. God blesses us with friends. But maybe he wants to stretch us. Maybe he wants to show us that there's more than chicken nuggets on the planet. There's more people to be in relationship with too, right? He starts right from the in the beginning to have the same attitude, attitude change. Not me talking to my kids. God's talking to me. He's talking to all of us. He's like, your attitude needs to be my attitude. The attitude that Jesus took, sacrificing everything to the cross suffering for our sins to the cross. So this needs to be your attitude, not the self-righteous attitude, which is so prevalent today, and I dare say was prevalent then, or else he wouldn't have had to talk about attitude. And he's talking about us being righteous and holy instead of self-righteous. Starts off just like that, have the attitude Because Jesus suffered for us and for our own sin, and when we come to know Jesus, we seek to turn away from sin and live as he desires us to live. He talks about these desires. 
We've all been there with some of them. Some desires that we struggle with aren't inherently bad or sinful, but they simply turn our eyes and affection away from Jesus into other things. Some things are very harmful. Some things will tear us up from the core. Some things will hurt us physically or or cause us to hurt other people physically, or cause us to not be able to live in this life as a Christ follower. He's saying it's focusing on desires in verses three to five. Take our attention and affection away from Jesus. One scholar says it's not about desiring things that are bad, but rather as desiring badly. And ask this, I love this, what is your super desire? Ever thought about that? What is your super desire? Maybe it's video games. There's a lot of video games in my house. I would submit that that's probably a super desire. Not a mine. They're way beyond Mario that came out when I was in high school. I can do that in Donkey Kong, but that was a long time ago. Maybe your super desire is binging your favorite Netflix show that finally comes out, long awaited, right? When they say it's coming out soon, and then it's a whole nother year. I've watched some of that too. I'm not saying I'm out of that. Maybe your super desire is food. Or maybe it's more harmful. Maybe it's alcohol or drugs or physical temptations. Maybe it's golf. In the early service, someone that was actually their first time, he's like, you're getting too close now. (laughs) We also have golf in our house. I just make them golf on Sunday afternoon, not on Sunday morning. What if, what if, Then you say, well, I was out at the golf course and I was giving my witness. I want to hear about your witness that you're giving when you're out on the golf course. Because no doubt those men and women need to hear your witness. Just were you giving your witness? What is your super desire that is taking your time and your affection away from Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that we can or should get rid of any or all of, well, some of those things, but all of those things. But when it's affecting my relationship with Jesus, that's dangerous. He's saying, take notice of your desires and what are your super desires He's saying you used to live before Jesus in lewd and lascivious behaviors. And when you came to know Jesus, he's counting on the fact that we leave those things behind. But the enemy wants to bring those back. He wants to tempt us with those things. But if we're sticking close to Jesus, we can fight those things, right? Our super desires are are easily seen by how we spend our time and our resources and our money and our thoughts. It's reflected in our daily life, isn't it? But Peter says, leave behind that stuff and start having a super desire for Jesus. That's our attitude adjustment. You need to leave that behind and you and if you can't handle it, you need to leave it behind. So One of us might be able to handle watching a show on Netflix, just maybe not for 12 hours. I'm pretty bad about leaving stuff on while I'm doing other things because of my squirrel brain that I have. And so like I I like to have sound or stuff I can glance up on because my brain is like a pinball machine or maybe like a hamster wheel at worst times. So I tend to do that too, and that might not be the best practice, but I get caught up in my own thoughts. What are our super desires? When our super desire should be to live for the will of God, not my own will, right? When something happens, what is God saying? So then in verse seven, this is awesome. 
he tells us to stretch ourselves in prayer. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Have you noticed that all through 1 Peter, just about every week, prayer has been in it. He's saying, stretch yourself in prayer. He's very serious here. He says, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And last week we talked about how Prayer is not the last thing we can do when we run out of options. It is the first thing and the best thing that we can and should do. Because when we pray, we're in communion with God and we invoke his name and we ask for his power and we ask him to intercede and we ask for his will. Not, oh, I can't think of anything else. I can't do anything else, so I'll pray. No, he's saying, be ready. Stretch yourself in prayer. Be watchful and diligent. Why is he saying to be watchful and diligent? Because of the other stuff he just talked about, all the things that are out there to tempt us and snare us, that the enemy wants us to be away from God. But when we pray, we're with God. He's saying, keep your eyes on him. And wherever you are in prayer, stretch it. If you pray five minutes a day, maybe stretch it to 10. If you pray 30 minutes, maybe stretch it to 45. If you pray an hour, stretch it to an hour and a half. You get, you get the math. I'm not going to do more math. That exhausts me. <laughs> but he's saying stretch it. Give more Susanna Wesley was the wife, oh, I mean the mom, of John Wesley, who is said to be the founder of Methodism. She had so many children, a whole lot. I think 10 or 12 or more. Some died in, as infants and so on. So I can understand why she couldn't really go to a prayer closet because they would destroy her house. But it's said that, you know, back then they would wear ap cooking, cooking aprons and said that her kids knew that if she raised her apron over her head, it meant that she was praying and they needed to leave her alone. She found a way. If she could find a way, we can find a way, right? Maybe buy an apron, I don't know. Go in a prayer closet. Sometimes the bathroom is the only place you can get away, but even that is not without its interruptions, if you have dogs or cats or other things around. Or in your car. Maybe you commute to work. Maybe in your bed before you get out of bed. But stretch yourself in prayer. When you're in relationship with someone that you like and love, can you hardly wait to go talk to them again? You're like, I'm so excited. I'm going to see my friend. I'm going to get to tell her everything. Or I get to see my, my spouse or my boyfriend or my girlfriend. That's how God wants us to be with him when he's our super desire. I want to pray. I want to listen. To be honest, sometimes we whine. I do. And then God's like, simmer down, change your attitude, and listen. Peter addresses it outright here. He's like, you have to be on watch and on guard. What if all of us prayed fervently for our communities, for our homes? What if you went through every room of your house and prayed for the Holy Spirit to be over and in it and in your family? What if you did that in your workplace? We definitely need to do it in our cars here on 501. We pray for our streets, we pray for our communities, we pray for our schools, we pray for our churches, we pray for our nation, we pray for our government, we pray for people to have their face towards Jesus. We will not run out of things to pray about. Sometimes to get out of my own head and my own agenda and prayer, I ask God to teach me what to pray for. God, what do you want me to pray for today? What is your heart? When we want our hearts to be his heart and he and him to be our super desire. Secondly, Peter calls us to stretch ourselves in love in verse eight. 
tells us to love each other deeply for love covers a multitude of sins. I bet you've heard that before. Maybe even from people that don't read the Bible because we, that's one of those verses that we have heard. What does that mean? He's saying when we love like Jesus that deeply, we don't pick apart what everybody says. We don't look at everybody with suspicion that they're trying to hurt us or deceive us. We might overlook things, some small things, some big things, not in a way that would be hurtful to our lives, but because when we're loving like Jesus, what we figure out is some of those things simply don't matter that much. I know this has happened to me and maybe to you, maybe you can relate that I've gotten really upset about something and probably said some things that I shouldn't have said and then as soon as it was over, I was like, that really wasn't that important, was it? But we live in a culture that says we should say everything that we want to say and respond to everything the way we want to respond. And we have a right to be heard. It's in the amendments. That all is true. But Jesus says to love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. It says to stretch yourself in love. He strained himself in love for us, didn't he? Throughout his life on this planet and on the cross, he stretched himself out in love. The question I believe God might be asking us is, are we straining ourselves? Are we stretching ourselves in love? Am I loving my spouse the best that I can? Am I loving my children? And not even the best that I can. I think that's the wrong question. Am I loving them how Jesus loves them? Am I loving the server at lunch today? And giving her or him grace, not knowing any idea what's happening in their lives that might cause them not to be Johnny on the spot. Am I loving the checkout person at the grocery store to want to be part of their lives and give them grace or give them a word of encouragement? Am I loving my boss? Am I loving my coworkers? Am I loving my neighbors? Am I being stretched? Because you see, our own human capacity to love, I believe, without God is nothing. Because God himself says in the Bible that he is love and love comes from God. And anyone that loves must know God. And if you don't love, then you don't know God. Because we're inherently selfish people. But with God, I can love because Jesus loves me. Remember that song? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And if he loves me, what right do I have to withhold love from anybody on the planet? Whether I agree with them, don't agree with them, 